Hey folks, it's Marvin Cash, the host of the Articulate Fly. On this episode, I'm joined by Matt Grajewski of Adaptive Fly. Matt shares his fishing and tying journey, and we take a deep dive into his unique style of predator flies. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. But a couple of housekeeping items first. If you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating and review in the podcatcher of your choice. It really helps us out. And a shout out to this episode's sponsor. This episode's sponsored by our friends at Steelhead Alley Outfitters. If you're going to chase steelhead or pike in the Lake Erie Tribs, you need to do it with the guys at Steelhead Alley Outfitters. Remember, go with SAO. So head on over to SteelheadAlleyOutfitters.com and get set up today. Now, on to our interview. Well, Matt, welcome to the Articulate Fly. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation, and we have a tradition. We always ask our guests to share their earliest fishing memory. The earliest fishing memory, it's it's kind of a tough one because so I grew up on Lake St. Clair, and we were out there all the time, and so it's kind of a, a cumulative memory of being out there all the time. I would say but probably one of my most vivid ones was the first time I saw a brown trout over 20 inches that my dad had caught. And I think that really stuck with me because it, it changed what, what my brothers and I did and, and how we fished and the, the type of fish we pursued of going after larger, the largest fish or the largest uh, fish of that species in a water. And it just, it really just flipped everything that we did. Yeah. Very neat. And when did you get drawn to the dark side of fly fishing? <laughs> um, it was, you know, my dad is the type, some, I grew up in a fishing family. My, my mom fished too. We were a family of six. I was probably, I was probably in high school before I realized people took vacations that weren't centered around hunting and fishing. Um, so my dad always was whatever worked. So he introduced us to bait fishing, lure fishing, fly fishing, if that was the most effective method. So we were always exposed to it. And it was one of those things, especially being a family of six in the boat, my dad didn't break out the fly rod a lot. So when he did, it was kind of very intriguing to my brothers and I. So that's probably what did it. And in my teens, it just, it just grew more and more. And so, you know, on the fly fishing front, was it trout or was it steelhead or, you know, obviously you've got a pretty amazing smallmouth fishery too, right? Yeah. So and as a kid, it was, large mouth and bluegills like that's when my dad would break out you know poppers rubber spiders and then but once you know we did a lot of trout fishing and once we started fly fishing for trout that's when it it really the bug got bad you know and, and wanted to do it just more and more so it was really trout that that really sucked us in Got it. You know, so you, you come from a fishing family, you know, who are some folks and it's happy to talk about, you know, your mom and your dad or your brothers. Mm -hmm. Um, but who are some of the folks that have kind of mentored you on your fly fishing journey? Yeah. And I would say it's on my fly fishing journey is it's, it's kind of tough to say cause my, my, you know, family, we fish so much that I didn't even fish with anybody outside of my family till I was away, away at college. So growing up, it, it really was my parents and and my brothers always, you know, my dad would be at a garage sale and see another fly rod that was, you know, I first one I remember using was made by Eagle Claw. The line was terrible. I didn't know it at the time. It was a floating line that did not float. Um, who knows how old it was. So, you know, my parents were always so encouraging about getting us in the outdoors. So it was, it was really them. And even though my mom didn't really fly fish, same thing she would be out and say oh i saw this fly box this guy sold me for five dollars can you use any of these you know and there's a hundred flies packed into a metal fly box so uh, it was it was really them uh you know that's obviously pre-internet days so it was hard to really get exposure to other people especially since i fished with my family so much it was it was really just my parents yeah very neat was that eagle claw one of the eagle claw fiberglass rides it was, it was, it was, I was still remember it was black and it had like the gold logo on it. Um, and if I remember correctly, I believe it was a, a seven, eight, uh, fly rod, you know, we used it for bluegills or trout or, or whatever we could fish for. We had, didn't even know when we were little kids, what the, what the difference was. And I'm sure it was totally overkill, but we caught fish on it and we had a blast. 
Yeah, it's interesting. If you don't have it in your nostalgic, I know because uh, I relatively recently interviewed Cameron Mortensen at the Fiberglass Manifesto. He sells those on his site for like 30 bucks, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. They work, right? All rides catch fish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so when did you get the fly tying bug? The fly tying bug. So my my brother, my older brother, so I have an older brother and a younger brother, and there's four years difference between all three of us. So we're, we're very close in age. And my older brother, Eric, got a little, it was probably a $20 kit, you know, that we that we clamped to a desk in his room. And the first thing we used to tie were like ice fishing jigs uh, for when we were kids. Um, and then, so that, that really started it. And I was probably in my late teens, I bought a Griffin vice. I still remember it. Same thing that the whole kit was probably under a hundred dollars and, um, started tying hare's ears and peasant tails and woolly buggers. Cause as a, especially I remember being in college and buying a dozen nymphs was, was a lot of money, uh, to a college student. So, I figured it'd be probably a better idea just to learn how to do this. So that's, and then once I started doing it, the right taking something out that you made, um, just, it just snowballed from there. Yeah. And I imagine we're talking to a little bit kind of pre-internet, right. Which means that yeah. the people that kind of influenced you and mentored you and fly tying are probably not what we would expect today. Who are some of those folks? And really for me, it was, uh, so there was a gentleman here in just north of Grand Rapids, uh, uh, that Glenn Blackwood that owned a fly shop and he sold materials to me super cheap and gave me a few flies as examples. And like you said, cause it was pre-internet and it, internet was probably just starting to be a thing at that time. I remember having to research for school papers, but there wasn't a whole lot of information in fly tying. So it was literally just staring at that hair's ear and trying to figure out, okay, I have this material. This looks like what the tail is. And then it looks like this is wrapped around here and it's got to be a little bit bigger at the front. And, and that, that was it. I mean, I didn't even know what a half hitch was or, or any of that. And it was the first ones were probably terrible, but the, the fish really don't care. Then they, they worked and caught fish. Yeah, and I imagine, too, probably you're still making trips to uh, the library, too, right? Exactly. Uh, that's what, and those, again, that, that stuff is not, anything fly tying related was not was not easy to find. And um, growing up in the area I grew up in, uh, basically like Metro Detroit, there wasn't a lot of fly fishing at all. Mostly took place, right, related to trout. There wasn't a whole lot of warm water fly fishing going on back then. I think that was another one of the draws for us was my dad fishing for bass and bluegills. We hadn't seen anybody else do it. I know people were, but if we went up to our cottage on the Asabo river, you would see people dry fly fishing all the time. So it was, uh, we just weren't exposed to it a ton. Got it. And so what do you tie on today? I tie on a Renzetti saltwater traveler. So, which is really for me is, I mean, all vices hold hooks. You find which one works for you. I'm obviously a little bit biased um, working for them, but it 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 fits what I do very well. I like a, a sort of a minimalist vice where a lot of the vice is out of the way because of the size flies I tie. Uh, so it works very well for me. Yeah, and I imagine you like the saltwater version because you're generally tying on pretty big hooks, right? Right, right. Yeah, because the range on that is four to eight dot. And it is not very often while it'll hold a size 12, uh, wouldn't be ideal on a regular basis. But when I put a size one hook in my vice, it, it seems small to me. <laughs> and I guess it means you have to go buy all your blue winged olive dry flies now, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I have to, I'm, now that I have, you know, my, uh, my oldest son is 13 and I'm trying to expose him to more and more. Uh, stuff and I've been getting them out trout fishing a little bit more and uh I had a I found a box that had dry flies in it from probably 10 years ago and they they still float <laughs> I was like well, at least I don't have to tie any but I remember as a kid buying you know a half dozen Hendrickson's and they would last me years yeah of course you could always call Lily and have her just send you a regular traveler right 
That's right. <laughs> I could. Uh, the fact that I have three saltwater travelers now seems a little bit excessive. I need her to send me a, a master vice is what I need. If you talk to her, <laughs> I've been working on her. I feel like I'm getting closer, but uh, that that would that would be great because that hook range is like eight out to twenty six. Yeah. So that'll cover everything. Yeah, there you go, and you know, throwing a pair of uh, shank jaws, and you'll be ready to go. Right. Yeah. Just a thousand dollar package. Just send it my way. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, so, you know, you tie predator flies now, and I know that, mm-hmm. you know, that's not, you know, you're tying for other people. It's not quite the same as what I would generally think of as a production tire. Cause you're not sitting there right. like cranking out 50 dozen, you know, number 12 mm-hmm. elk or caddis, but you know, what drew you to wanting to tie for other people? So I would say I fought it for a long time because I enjoyed it so much. I always had this concern that it would would ruin something that I enjoyed. Um, but after well, I lost my leg in 2016, and it took me a while to be able to return to work, and the house starts to feel like a prison because you're just in it all day a lot of times by yourself. And um, tying flies was – so coming off a lot of those pain meds, uh, battling withdrawals, tying flies was what really kind of would help me take my, like my brain off the withdrawal symptoms. And then it just kind of spun into taking a few orders to help pass the time. And, and it just kind of kept going and going. What was the, the biggest surprise as you moved from tying for yourself to tying for other people? I would say it was probably just the number of orders. You know, I'm, I'm not a big, I've never been, even when forums, while I would spend some time on forums and on social media, I was, I always felt a little bit like I lived under a rock uh, in, in, in those terms of, of what was available online. So I always just went by learning, uh, going out and doing it. And so when I started, when I did like a social media post that I would be doing, taking some orders, I was really surprised at the number of orders that I received. And the number of orders I continued to receive to the point to where I wondered if it was a good idea would this turn, you know, something I enjoy in a hobby into work. And so that was that was the thing that probably surprised me the most. I mean, maybe I don't know what, what to call it, but I was surprised that that many people wanted to buy my flies. Yeah, really interesting. And, you know, in terms of kind of the day to day blocking and tackling of being a production tire, you know, what are some of those challenges that you faced? Yeah, so I have. You know, I have a 17 year old, a 13 year old and a three year old. Um, and you know, working for Renzetti, it's all, um, website work and some social media stuff. And so finding the time, uh, especially with, uh, with COVID this year and, and all my two oldest were, um, did virtual all year. So they're home all the time. So it's just finding that time of feeling like you're not putting a family aside too much because like I said, some of these flies could, if I have an order of a half dozen, that could be two plus hours of time, you know? So it's, it's just finding the time and balancing everything. Did you have a problem with COVID? I know there are massive supply chain problems, right? And, um, you know, I'd certainly have experienced issues procuring materials to tie flies with. Mm -hmm. Did that impact you as as well? It didn't impact me because I'm fortunate to know, some people that I could always reach out to, uh, like the, the, I use a lot of whiting American rooster saddles and those are very hard to get, but between Mike Schultz and Kelly Gallup, they, they always had my back, which I was just very, very fortunate. Otherwise I'm sure I would have, I would have run into issues. And, and partly I think the, the materials I use aren't as common or, um, a lot of tires don't use, so that might have helped me out a little bit where supply doesn't have to be high because not a lot of people are buying it, but um, but just fortunate I have some people I can reach out to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you were talking about learning to fly fish uh, basically for, for panfish and largemouth bass. You yes. know, what drew you to predator flies? So when we started, like I would say in my – probably around 14, 15 years old, like trying to catch the biggest trout in the river uh, became something my brothers and I just really enjoy doing. And when a trout gets 
especially over 23, 24 inches, it just becomes a predator. And the way that they, you know, the way that they attack a fly uh, or the way they attract, attack a small trout or a sculpin. So that was an easy, like that was kind of the bridge to going after pike and musky more. I mean, these were things that we fished for with gear when we were kids. So once we started tying fly six, seven, eight inches and getting them to cast and swim well, then it was an easy transition into just other predator stuff. Got it. Cause I guess that probably happened about the same time that the gear, the tackle got so much better for, I guess what I would call kind of non-traditional fly fishing species, right? Yeah. Yeah, there was, I mean, in, even in the very beginning, I mean, I remember using, um, sometimes using tarp, what were tarpon rods, uh, you know, it's, there wasn't a lot of 10 to 11 weights you could get your hands on, but the lines got a lot better. You know, you had 400, 450, 500 grain sinking lines. And some of those came from out East that were used for stripers. So you had to mix and match at that time, but the, the equipment was available and it was adequate. Yeah. Were you rolling your own, uh, heads on your fly lines? You, I didn't really have to just because of the, um, you know, he had like real outbound lines that were made to throw like bigger flies into wind. Now, what was considered big at that time was different. You know, that's where really anything over, set, you know, seven, eight inches would have been considered big. But the, the grains and the lines were heavy enough uh, that you could get them out there. I messed a little bit with, with trying to build our own. And, you know, I had a lot of T8, T11, T14 from swinging flies for steelhead, but it was just it was kind of clunky and because you have to strip the line all the way up, you know, as, as you're aware to the last two, three feet, if you have those knots and that clunkiness, it can get just really cumbersome, cumbersome over the day. No, absolutely. And, you know, I was preparing for the interview. I was looking at your online store and, you know, looking at your flies, you know, they have a very distinct style. And I was wondering how you would describe that to folks. So, I mean, that's, I mean, that, that is actually, that's a really good question. When I saw that, I, I thought that was really interesting and it's, it's, it's almost tough. It's almost tough for me to really put something on it, but I kind of think of, I want flies that will cast, you know, especially when you're thinking about that size, I want them to fish in a certain way. So I always, and I always like to add something to the fly that I enjoy. When you musky fish, you see a fly coming back to you a ton without a fish behind it or on it. So I like to have something on there that I see I enjoy. So I always think of like cast fish fun is kind of a thing that goes through my head is when I'm trying to design a fly or I'm trying to tweak a fly is how will it cast, how will it fish and what's in this kind of what's in this for me to keep my focus and my attention. And, and it's those bigger flies are, you have a large canvas, so it is a lot of art, you know, you can, you can add whether it's color or different materials that you can't use on smaller flies that allow you to be more that hold like marker and color very well that allow you to be more creative. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Cause I mean, the heads are very distinctive, right? It's, it's usually a flat head of a synthetic or a bucktail, right? And the tail, right. the tail sections are generally feather, uh, feather driven, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how, you know, how did you kind of arrive at that style? I mean, what was the performance feature that, um, that drove you to that? Yeah. So being from Michigan, uh, just one of those things you grew up in life and you're for, you're, there are things that you're fortunate of being in a certain area and exposed to. And, and guys like Kelly Gallup, um, was a, was definitely a big influence for me and his fly design. So he used a lot of flop and tails for, you know, you can accomplish quite a bit with, with a stiffer, webbier tail, you get profile, you get, it's light and easy to cast and you get kind of that, what guys always refer to as the kick out of that fly. And so I learned a lot in tying trout flies and, and, and some things that I, you know, saw from Kelly when I was younger and then learning the true like benefits of pushing water, not from, for a fish attraction standpoint, but from a hydraulic standpoint and how you can get that fly to swim. So that was a lot of the basis of a tail that is, has a purpose, doesn't have too much drag. You know, I do use some synthetics for tails and I'm very deliberate about which ones I use. So I don't have too much drag and, and kill the momentum 
the energy I've inputted into that fly. So it's kind of those two things is like you said, it's, it's the tail and the head are a big part of that fly and what you want it to do. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things, and we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, um, you know, to be tying predator flies, I thought it was really interesting that you, you know, I would kind of say, you know, it's maybe an old school chassis in the sense of that you're still tying on pretty long shank hooks. Um, I don't think your flies use shanks and you're doing kind of looks like the more traditional, you know, loop to, to attach the second hook. I was kind of interested mm-hmm. about that because that seems a little bit different from kind of where a lot of predator fly tires are. Yeah. And it's kind of funny, like when you, like you said, when we started talking about this, um, you know, kind of before we went live and it was to think of it as old school is, I mean, it's, it kind of reflects my age, but also just anything and, and fly tying related to large streamers now is becoming old school that it's been around that long, but that's, again, probably comes from my background of, of stuff like what Kelly and guys like Russ Madden were doing. And I was always very interested in lure making when I was a kid. And I think again, that was an easy transition to fly tying because I'm making the lure and how glide baits work, how jointed rapalas work and where with shanks, you get a lot of sort of a slinky action to it. Um, and you can get a lot of very lifelike action to it for a lot of what I fish for and what's productive and what I enjoy is when a fish basically just reacts and doesn't think. And so by using a very, very deliberate joint and a very specific size loop around that rear hook, I'm creating that hinge that I can really get flies to turn and swim very erratically. You know, I don't, I'm not, for what I do, I'm not concerned with how lifelike it's looking. It's, the predator fish sees something, it looks wounded, it looks freaked out, it looks like the predator needs to, you know, this fish is in fight or flight, what am I going to do? It's my job to just kill it, that's that's the reaction I'm looking for. And I can accomplish that with that old school style. Yeah, and interesting too, because I imagine, right, that, you know, the fish that you like to target with those flies are so large that that mm-hmm. kind of you know, adage about not wanting to have all that leverage and that really long shank really doesn't apply because it's not like a trout cranking down on like a three or four X long streamer hook. Right. And you have, you know, muskies, you have very long and wide head shakes. I mean, you're on an average size muskie, that head could really be covering about three feet of distance. It's not like a more of like the quick wiggle of a trout. And while there absolutely are some benefits to probably shorter shanked um, hooks, uh, it really comes down to even the leader set up and how well you bury that hook in that fish that I, I've never had a ton of trouble with, with losing fish. And if I go to shorter shank hooks, I lose what I'm accomplishing in action. And there are guys like, obviously like Blaine that is, uh, doing some really cool stuff with shanks and, you know, with getting, uh, more of a, like a jerk bait action to that fly. Uh, so it certainly, um, is possible. It's just that I guess that old school style that I come from is, is something I enjoy so much. Uh, while I really admire some of the more newer modern stuff, mine is kind of a mix. Yeah. Very neat. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about kind of the aesthetic that you like, and we've talked a little bit about kind of the head and the tail system, but why don't you tell folks a little bit about, you know, your design philosophy when you're trying to create another, a new pattern? it kind of goes off of that, uh, kind of the cast fish fun. Um, I always encourage people to be deliberate about what you want to accomplish with a fly. Uh, the larger the fly gets, the easier it is to just start adding stuff to it and add too much material. Um, adding too much material is probably the most common uh, mistake that I see. So it's how do I create the profile I want with the least amount of materials? And what do I want that fly to do? Do I want it to jig, you know, drop on the paws? Do I want it to kick sideways or up on the paws? And all of those things from where I add weight to every single predator fly tie and where I add that weight is based on how I want the fly to swim, right? So all of that has to factor in. And then where I'm placing that weight could also change how I'm, what materials I can tie in where, because the larger the fly, the larger the amount of weight, 
large amount of space it could take up on a shank or make materials difficult to tie in. So, uh, you know, a lot of it was trial and error in the beginning um, and, and learning, starting to learn what worked. But that's really, I know, I usually always start with what action do I want? Then I start to think about what profile, whether it's, you know, from top to bottom or how long I want that fly to be. And then that kind of transitions into all of those other aspects to build that out. Yeah. And not to ask you to give away any trade secrets, but no, that's okay. Um, but right yeah, but you know, I guess to me, they're kind of, I guess, two things. I mean, can you talk a little bit about kind of how the head shape and the tail material and then where you place the weight relates to the action that you're trying to get in the fly? Yep. So the, like the easiest, most obvious one is weight in the front. If you want the fly to drop, I mean, a, a jig is maybe the most effective bait ever created because most dying fish fall to the bottom. They don't float to the top. Um, so that jig is a very effective dying motion of, of a fish. So that's the easiest one. Um, then if I really want to fly to kick to the side and give me more of that glide action, it's a rear weight. And that's typically pretty much the very back of whatever the last section is that I'm tying in is there are some variations, but that's the general idea is, and I've given this analogy a bunch, uh, but it's that trailer with too much wood in it and it, the back drives the front, right? If you're driving a truck with too much wood in it, you have a hinge at the hitch, right? That's your hinge. So like an articulated fly, that's where your hinge is. And if you have too much weight in the back, if you try to going down a hill, try to stop that truck, the trailer wants to push the front. And when that happens, right, you lose control of the front. So by putting that weight in the very back, when I impart energy into that fly, when I strip it, that energy carries to the back where that weight is and that weight takes longer to stop. So it pushes the front. I have my hinge in that old school style, forces the front of the fly one direction. And now as soon as I've started that, if you think about if you were to draw a line from yourself to that fly, the fly is turning the other way. So the fly line is also your leader's turning. So when you go to strip again, it has to force it back the other way. So that's where, that's where the effectiveness comes from rear weight. And if I have a fly where I'm more concerned about it, just really kind of having that just more of like a hover on the pause, you know, then that some of that weight needs to be split a bit, little bit more towards the middle or add something near the front to offset that, whether it's some type of hidden foam, you know, or something to kind of balance that out. Got it. And, you know, how much did your gear fishing from when you were a kid kind of help you shortcut this kind of weighting and hinging of your flies? Oh, I helped a ton. Like I used to always watch the Larry Dahlberg lure making segments where he's in his garage, like a mad scientist creating all sorts of stuff. And I just always remember, especially in the glide bait, he was always very deliberate about where he was putting that weight, where he was drilling out, you know, that wood glide bait to insert weight. And so that, that helped it done. And then jointed rapalas have a very, very specific hinge. You know, it's not, not long and drawn out. It's two very small metal loops wrapped around each other. So that, that sort of, that hinge is what I always think of in my head is, you know, it all just kind of, melted together when I was starting to get better action out of my flies. Got it. And, you know, so you, you sort of have a fishing problem you want to solve. How long does it kind of yeah. take you to go from the drawing board to having a fly that you like to fish for yourself and you're willing to sell online in your shop? So now it's, that process is very short. I will never sell a fly without fishing it and fishing it effectively. Um, it's just a personal preference. Um, but I know now when I finish something at the bench, I'll 99 plus percent positive that it's going to swim how I want. 10 years ago, that number was definitely lower, you know, and there was a, there was a lot of trial and error from weight placement, the amount of weight, which materials to use so that it didn't, cause anytime I, especially in musky fishing, if I can get that fly to move two feet or more to one side, that's going to dramatically increase um, the amount of bites I get. So if the materials are creating too much drag and sucking up that energy that I put into the fly, it could kill it after six inches or 10 inches. So um, now that I have a really good idea about all of that through trial and error, it's 
it if I have an idea in my head and I put it to a fly, there's a uh, the high likelihood it'll work. Got it. Yeah. And I guess that explains why there's such a significant drop off from kind of the, the size and profile of the heads to the tails of your flies too, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like really, and then some of them are like the yard sale has a very flat head. Um, if you look at it from straight on, it's, you know, top to bottom, it's not small, but if you look at it from straight on left to right, it is. And that is because that fly, I do want it to swim side to side very effectively and not change direction up and down as much more of like your standard glide bait and that flat profile on the sides. I think when people see that fly in person, it's, it's a little bit surprising. It's how thin that fly is when you look at it straight on, but that flat profile on the sides, like a glide bait helps it, um, what it's pushing against when it's trying to swim. Got it. And we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording about the differences between pike and musky and how musky guys don't like people to call them pipe. Uh, but, but, but it, it, we talked a little bit about the difference in the, is in the behavior, but could you share with folks maybe kind of, you know, how the species behavior is different and how that translates into your fly designs? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, a pike, like most fish are as dumb as their stomachs and a pike's metabolism is so much higher than a muskie. And that's, that's probably the biggest difference. And, a muskie's harder to catch because it feeds less often. It needs to take less chances. It has less competition for food. Where a pike, high metabolism, pike are usually high density. They're, they can't take a chance and let something else steal their food. So a pike, I can catch a pike on a fly that has way less action than it was required on a muskie. And now you could run across a muskie that's hungry and you throw something in front of it and it swims like a wet sock but that fish wants to eat and it'll just climb on that can definitely happen but your the amount of fish that that you hook goes up dramatically the better action your flies have and that's true with pike as well but i could go out and catch 10 pike on a fly that really has no action and comes straight back to the boat but if the fly swam well i might have caught 20 or 30 but that's with musky it goes from maybe i catch a couple of fish a season or do I catch, you know, 50 fish a season or a hundred fish a season? And that's, that's the biggest difference is the flies have to swim well. And like I said, again, you could take a fly out and it worked and you caught a muskie. And a lot of times that's the goal. And it might've been one in your lifetime or one in your season was all you were hoping for. But if you want to start to increase um, your opportunities at muskies, it's, it's the action and the fly is going to be the biggest difference. Yeah, got it. And, you know, um, the name of your business is Adaptive Fly, and I was wondering if you could let folks kind of know the genesis of the name. Yeah. Uh, so it, it came out of losing my leg, uh, and I learned, it, previously not being handicapped, the handicapped people often like to be referred to as adaptive or you have adaptive athletes, and I've always thought of my tying and fishing as adaptive. I've This comes from my parents. Um we never went out and just accepted the fish worm biting. Like my parents constantly switched up tactics, switched up the water we were fishing, something to figure out how to catch fish that day. So that was just ingrained in me with my, my tying and my fishing. So it just kind of fit both worlds and it, it just stuck. Yeah, very neat. That's kind of what I tell my two boys is basically, you know, find a way or make a way. Right, exactly. And it's, it's, uh, Sometimes the fish beat you, but I know that every time I go out, it wasn't from a lack of trying or a lack of switching things up. And honestly, I've learned so much on days where it was tough, uh, way more than on days when it was good. Um, Because when it's good and they're biting, it's like almost anything works right. But it's those tough days of maybe grinding out like one bite um, that can really be eye-opening that turns into four or five on those days where it was always zero. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that's kind of true of life in general too, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, so, so back kind of on the, the tackling uh, front, I always ask all of the kind of production guys that come on the podcast to share, you know, two or three uh, tips that regular tires can use that they wouldn't think of because they just don't tie as much as you do. Gotcha. Uh, I would say start with what do you want to accomplish? Like when you sit down the vice you want to tie, and that could be, I bought a cool new material and I want to use it. That could be, 
you know, the start of what do I want to accomplish? That material could lead to, I want to use this for trout or I want to use this for smallmouth. And then, you know, do I want that fly to sink? Do I want it to be buoyant? So always, what do you want to accomplish is what I always think of when I'm going to sit down and do something, try to do tie something different or something I haven't before. Um, another thing would probably be just use, use what's necessary. There are so many great materials out there today and they come in such a wider range of colors. It's easy to think, oh, I want to add this or I want to add that. Or, I mean, I see, it seems like I see rubber legs nowadays on 90% of flies. And sometimes the rubber legs are so buried that they don't actually do any good, right? So it's like, use what's necessary. If you really want to use a certain material, just tie another fly. If it's, you're not going to just cram it onto that hook. Um, and then just really experiment. Uh, I know, like you said, if you're not tying a ton or you're not fishing a ton, a ton that experimenting might not be in the cards for you that day because you have limited amount of time, but you learn so much from experimenting and from failing, uh, trying something that didn't work and going back to the drawing board and everyone's different for me. That's like, that's so enjoyable to me. Uh, well, I never, when I do something, I think I'm not thinking, man, I hope this fails. But when it fails and I correct it, like I change it and it works, that is, that's extremely satisfying for me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, who are some of the, you know, tires that you kind of follow and keep up with that kind of inspire you or you kind of keep an eye on kind of what they're doing and how they're using things and how they design their flies? Yeah, I would say, I mean, Blaine's definitely up there near the top of the list because our tying styles are so different um, that I just always, curious of what you know what he's working on and, and what he's doing because like you said the I, i'm always going to refer to it as the old school style now <laughs> i feel like that's going to stick uh i'm not interested in seeing other people tying the the same way uh that i do my a good buddy of mine eli barrett um from great lakes fly is always i mean he was even a big push for me to get into predator tying uh, he used to send me flies before i was selling before i was tying them myself and um, I'm always interested in what he's doing. Uh, a buddy of mine, Nick Granado out in Utah, who is much more into lure making now than, than fly fishing, uh, was always doing some really cool stuff. And I'm even interested in the lures he's making now because it gives me ideas, uh, in, in what I'm doing. And probably the last one off the top of my head is there's a lure making company called Team Rhino Outdoors. And I guess they're not lure makers, but they paint lures. And so I always like am checking their website for when they put out new baits that they painted for color ideas because that's something I really enjoy. Yeah, really interesting. What's one tying tool that you can't live without? It would, gosh, that's a hard question, right? Because if you sat down at your desk, you'd think every one of them you couldn't live without. Yeah, uh, think about the, kind of the odd, think about the oddball <laughs> tool, like not scissors yeah. or a whip finisher, but something that you know the average tire wouldn't think would be like mission critical. I, I, for me, it, then if if it's the odd thing that most people might not think of as super critical, it'd probably be the chair. Um, when you, uh, for me, sitting in, if I were to sit in a chair that wasn't comfortable for me in terms of and what I need when I'm tying, which is I really need like straight back sitting up straight at the desk. My back starts to kill. Lower back starts to kill me after an hour. So I spent a lot of time trying different chairs, researching chairs online before finding what would work for me, but I couldn't, if I had to go back to a, a chair that didn't work for me ergonomically, it, it would be really hard to put in the time. Yeah. And what chair do you use today? Cause I imagine there are a lot of people that are like my back hurts. What chair does. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't even tell you. I, all I know is I believe I bought it from office Depot after trying probably 40 chairs driving around to different stores that night I tried buying chairs online and it's so hard to really get an idea even from the height you know I'm not a very big guy I'm about five eight so if I'm if my feet aren't flat on the floor and my knees aren't at 90 degrees like it's there's no way I'm making it four hours in that chair so I couldn't even tell you what it is yeah I guess a related point then that probably means if you like sitting that way up straight you probably have the stem of your vice higher probably than most people do right I do. So that, that's uh, probably another piece of it is I have the extended stem uh, that Renzetti makes. So it's about, I think it's two inches longer. 
than the standard one that comes with the vice. And so, yeah, those two things go together without that stem extension. It's too low on the desk for me. Yeah. And I guess really that's not a predator fly thing. I mean, that's true for everybody because you're trying not to hunch over, right? Yes. And you don't, when you sit down and tie like one or two flies here and there or before going fishing or crank out, you know, a dozen nymphs in a half hour, like you don't, you don't realize how valuable that is. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm my, my wheels are spinning. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things, right? It's just, it's just the uh, more you do something, the more you start to figure out and then they become so you become so used to them that if you didn't say, think of something outside of the tool you pick up every time, I probably wouldn't have think of listing the chair, but I've spent more time trying to find the right chair than the right vice, the right scissors, the right Bob and all of that. Yeah. Very neat. And is there anything before I let you hop on the horizon for adaptive fly you want to share with us? I don't know if I have, I wouldn't say anything necessarily new coming up that's, that's really in the hopper, but the the website is still fairly new and I have bigger plans for that. This, like we were talking in the very beginning about uh, life kind of throws you curveballs with, with us moving and selling our home. And so, but I do have plans of, of trying to one, keep a higher supply on the website of flies because they're pretty much selling as fast as I can get them on there because I'm not getting a ton on there, but also I just was starting to experiment with selling like four packs of trout flies where it's always just been pike and musky and, and maybe incorporating some more of that where I have time. So, cause I know there's a lot of people reach out wanting stuff in smaller sizes. So as time permits, I'll, I'll probably try to do more of that. Got it. And you know, obviously with uh, COVID receding mercifully, you're probably yeah. going to get to fish more this year than you did last year. But um, <laughs> yeah. is that also, you know, I don't know, do you uh, kind of make your rounds on kind of the fly tying show circuit? A, a little bit, you know, I always, there are certain people that have always been good to me that I try to always make time for like bar flies with Schultz's. Uh, I always do that. I don't know if I'll make it to uh, eye cast now that it's in the fall fall. It really cuts into whitetail bow hunting. So that's, uh, that's a little bit tougher. There's usually some more local stuff and I do some fundraisers, but I usually don't travel outside of Michigan, uh, very much at all. I've done the uh, streamer love fest down in Cotter in Arkansas, uh, the like three years before, before COVID hit. And maybe I'll pick up on that again. Got it. So it's always, you, a, it's always a good time. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, before I let you go, you want to let folks kind of know, you know, where they can find your shop online, how they can follow you on social media and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So adaptivefly.com is the website. And like I said, you know, for at least the foreseeable future, you'll just pretty much see out of stock on everything, but you get an idea of what I do. Um, and then on Instagram is adaptive fly. Uh, that's really the only social media that I dabble in. Um, but you'll, I try to post on that on a regular basis so I can keep everybody up to date of what are the patterns I'm offering? What are the new colors that I'm working on or what's available on the website? I always try to post it on there when it goes live. Got it. Well, and I'll certainly drop all that stuff in the show notes too. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, listen, Matt, I super appreciate you running all the potential buyers for your house out so you could talk to me tonight. <laughs> Not a problem. Not a problem. And like you said, more fishing. The we're actually the home we're moving to is is lakefront and it has pike in it, it has a few tiger muskies in it. So that getting to do more fishing COVID or not is definitely in my future. Well, that's awesome. Well, listen, Matt, thanks again so much. Not a problem. I appreciate it. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. Again, if you like the podcast, please tell a friend and please subscribe and leave us a rating and review in the podcatcher of your choice. Tight lines, everybody. <laughs>